So let me just uh, introduce our presenters for today. The first is uh, Moritz Piatti. Moritz is a senior economist at the World Bank, working at the nexus of public finance management and health. He's interested in how the balance, to balance fiscal control with service delivery needs, and has written extensively on the use of finance management information systems. His work is currently focused on reforms in the Africa region, where he leads various analytical programs, including on how to deploy disruptive technology solutions. Prior to joining the World Bank, Moritz worked as an advisor in the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar, Tanzania, where he supported the government in budget management and the introduction of health financing reforms. Moritz holds a, an MSc in economics for development, economics for development from Oxford University and a master of arts in economics from the University of uh, Aberdeen. The other presenter, a joint presenter, is Collins Chansa. And Collins is a senior health economist at the World Bank Group. And prior to joining the World Bank in 2011, Collins worked for 12 years at the Ministry of Agriculture and later the Ministry of Health in Zambia and has a, and as a part-time researcher for various local and international institutions. In his 21 years career, Collins has gained wide ranging experience in health systems development governance and health financing, including results based financing in several countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Collins has also conducted, published and peer reviewed several pieces of research. Of research. He is a co-author of a book uh, titled Zambia, Building Prosperity and Resource Wealth under Oxford University Center for for the study of African economies series and Africa policies for pro prosperity. Collins received his master's degree in health economics from the University of Cape Town and a degree in economics and statistics from the University of Zambia. He is currently pursuing a, a PhD at Heidelberg University in uh, Germany. The other presenter, the third one, is Tom Hart. And Tom is a senior research fellow in the in development and public finance team at the Overseas Development Institute, where he works on public financial management, fiscal decentralization, and health financing. And before joining ODI, Tom worked for seven years in East Africa, initially as an ODI fellow in the Ministry of Finance in South Sudan. And he subsequently worked as a consultant for various organizations, including African Development Bank, USAID, and the World Bank. Before moving to East Africa, Tom started his career in the UK civil service at, the, at Her Majesty's Treasury. And uh, we also have uh, Takon Ramwase as one of the presenters, but Tom will present on behalf of him and the Takondwa. Uh, those who attended the last week's uh, webinar, or rather the last webinar we had about two weeks ago, I also introduced uh, Takondwa, he was one of the presenters, and he's a senior health economist with over 25 years of national and international experience in health economics, health financing reforms, health systems and services development and strengthening, and health services systems research. Dr. Mwase has uh, extensive expertise and experience in leading, developing, supporting, and managing small and large complex and innovative health programs and providing technical assistance, support, technical and policy advice, and consulting services to over 20, 20 sub saharan African countries and beyond on health sector financing and services reforms, performance-based financing, social and national health insurance, health planning, priority setting, and resource allocation, among others. Dr. Mwase is currently working as a health economics advisor on the Tanzilaonse with the Health Economics Policy Unit, Health uh, College of Medicine and in the University of Malawi. So those are our uh, presenters, and I'll soon be inviting uh, uh, the first presenter to give us the presentation. But uh, before I do that, just a reminder of uh, our housekeeping uh, technical issues. We encourage uh, participants 
to, if they have any questions, to use the QA box where they will post their, uh, their questions. Please do not use the, the chat box, use the QA uh, box or on, the, on the panel. Alternatively, when we get to the discussion, we may use the raise hand feature, which then we'll be able to, to we'll be able to uh, recognize you and give you the floor to, to, to give, to ask your question. And of course, when you raise your, when we give you the floor, Alex will unmute you so that you're able to raise your, your question. Just again to mention that uh, this webinar is being recorded because we record all the webinars that we are holding in the series and we post this on the Health Economics Hub on the Global Health Network. So please take note that this uh, webinar is being uh, recorded. So we invite part participants when they message us through the chat, chat box to note their name and also email address and institution so that if you would like to, to receive materials from the webinar and continue to receive updates about uh, our forthcoming webinars. So those are our announcements before we, uh, before we start with the presentations. At this juncture, let me invite uh, the first two speakers, Moritz and Collins, uh, to give us uh, the first uh, presentation. So I believe it will be Moritz uh, going first. Moritz? May I give you the floor, please? Thank you very much, Edward. Um, and uh, thanks for having us. Let me share my screen. Right. Um, does that seem to work? I think if you move on to presentation view. Pardon me? Um, are you able to move on to presentation view? Um, I think we. Yeah, you can't see the screen. I think if you can share it one more time for us. Yep. Great. All right. Um, okay. So um, thanks so much, um, dear Edward, for your kind introduction. Um, I'll be starting the presentation and then Collins Chancer will um, join me shortly. So what is um, public financial management and, and um, why are we having this session in the first place? And why, why should we care about it? Right? Public financial management in, in general has a terrible reputation. Right? Um, in working in development, um, right? We care about a number of things, like service delivery. We care about getting kids to school. We care about, um, you know, um, uh, macro fiscal issues about about um, your water and sanitation. But but um, public financial management has this reputation of being a, about accounting and being essentially very boring. Right? But I think this is um, not necessarily um, how one has to see it. And so, so um, even if you care about things like um, um, service delivery and getting kids to school and um, health service delivery outcomes and, and, and so forth, um, you need the adequate piping and um, the systems in place to actually make this happen. And, and that this is in essence what um, public financial management is about. Right? So um, actually um, making policy happen. Right? And, and, um, and in that sense, uh, public financial management is very important and it can be um, very exciting to work on right? because across sectors, um, this is um, this will be of importance, and it's um, extremely um, practical. Right? It's things that that um, governments care about and do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, yeah, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's making sure that funds actually um, reach the front lines, that there is accountability, there there is efficiency um, across sectors, and and um, making things happen. So one way to think about um, public financial management 
is is to visualize a budget cycle and and, and uh, there are many ways of of doing that and um, at, depending on how granular one wants to be but um, for sake of simplicity uh, one can think about um, the overarching um, strategic planning and prioritization aspects and right? so um, where what is happening with that regard then how are priorities actually um, integrated into the budget so in the budget formulation and the budget approval process and one can think about how once the budget is formulated and approved the budget is actually being implemented right? what happens with uh, with regards um, to that and how are things then accounted for and reported against and finally how are is the budget being evaluated so how is um, is what you've done actually being reflected in in um, in um, the evaluations and how does that then inform the subsequent budget cycle so a brief primer of of um, thinking through how these PFM aspects affect service delivery goals in the health sector and um, I like this chart because um, it helps one think through the, the transmission channel right? and, and think, think through specifically with the service provider, with the health service provider in mind, the budget cycle aspects on the one hand and the service delivery goal on, on the others. Right? Because public financial management can very easily be seen as something quite abstract. Right? So, so, you know, budget formulation and budget execution, fine, but what does it actually mean um, in terms of um, how service providers function and how and their capacity to deliver against service delivery goals. Right? So um, the budget cycle on, on the left hand side of this of, of this chart um, goes through all of the things that I've just discussed. Right? And, and, that, and we make the argument here that um, the service providers should have the, the objective of delivering against um, efficiency, equity, equality, and accountability goals. Right? And um, here we argue that the way that the service providers are managed, right, the public financial management, um, the public financial management environment will determine how well a service provider can deliver against these service delivery goals. Right? And this will then de depend, among other things, on on a various um, set of, of um, foundations or, or principles, if you like. And so you can think about um, um, the, uh, the legal status of the provider and, um, and uh, flexibility in, in spending and autonomy issues right, on the one hand. So, so that means that that could mean, um, you know, is it a public or private provider? Is it um, is the provider being explicitly recognized in the budget? Can the provider receive funds, um, and and does the provider have the the um, um, authority to spend funds? And how flexible is the provider in being allowed to spend funds? Then one can think about financial management capacity, right? So, um, what is the capacity of the of the um, of the facility, if you like, in in um, in the prudent management of funds, right? so are they able to to maintain a ledger, keep receipts? Is there account? Is the financial accountability? Then um, there is um, the performance orientation or say, an output orientation. Um, so, um, what extent is there? Like, are we working in a fee for service type environment, or at where where, where uh, health facilities get reimbursed against the uh, number and and um, um, the number of services that are being provided and the quality of services, or um, or is there a capitation environment? Is there a formula against which the service providers receive um, the budget allocation, and so on? And then one can think about um, the degree to which um, the, the, the revenue flows to service providers are fragmented right? or whether there is a unified um, payment system. And so, very, so frequently um, health facilities receive funds from a number of different sources. And so that may on the one hand 
be the government budget, it may also be money from user fees, it may be resources for, um, from insurance payments, it may be various development partners, and um, and so on. Right. So there's just this question of um, um, how how fragmented is the system, and and how does this lead to potential inefficiencies? And, and all of these factors together um, then will, as, as we mentioned earlier, determine um, the environment within which the service provider operates and whether the, the um, service provider can operate against those service delivery goals. Right? So um, just to give you a few examples on, on how here in this case, a poor and public financial management can undermine service delivery. And, um, Right. Um, so on. So if if I go back up to the other slide, right, you can you can think about um, this as as um, a set of um, matrices. So you can think about these um, these four um, service provider dimensions: this transmission channel, and how they affect efficiency, equity, quality, and accountability. Right? You can think about um, right, um, arguments of how the unified um, budget provision affects those four service delivery goals or how a financial management capacity affects those goals and so on. And, and just some um, examples on this uh, with regards to efficiency, for example, um, that's if, if um, there are rigid internal controls with um, limited flexibility of um, budget reallocations, that can um, be challenging for service providers to, um, to meet emerging needs. And so what this, uh, um, essentially means is if the budget is predetermined in the beginning of the year against a very explicit set of, um, of inputs, then you know the actual requirements may change and it may be very difficult to make um, reallocations in due course. And so if things come up such as you know a cholera outbreak that was unanticipated or something like um, COVID, um, then, then it may be difficult and, and inefficient for service providers if they cannot um, adjust to changing needs. Um, similarly, you know, service providers may also simply adjust and, and um, break some of these rules you know, simply because that is um, what needs to happen in order to deliver efficiently, but then that undermines the foundations of the public financial management systems and, and is, is equally problematic. Another efficiency problem potentially is that um, late uh, budget releases or inadequate um, budget releases can lead to arrears and price increases. And so um, we've seen this in a number of countries where, um, where there are in principle um, budget provisions and commitments made against these budget provisions. But then if the release doesn't happen then um, at these, these suppliers don't get paid and these suppliers then build in the risk premium um, in everything they do uh, because payments are, are going to be late and that in, invariably then leads to a price increase and, and um, therefore inefficiencies right? if, there's, if there is a price differential between the public and the private sector. So, so um, another important challenge to think about. Um, equity. In, in principle, one might argue that public financial management isn't completely equity equity uh, neutral, right? So how, how does a PFM system care about equity? And I think that's, that's um, I think a good, good um, position and, and appropriate position to take. However, um, equity considerations are frequently built into um, how a budget is being formulated. And if then the budget is not being executed according to a plan, right? and um, that may very well undermine these um, equity considerations that were that were built in. And so if the budget isn't e executed in full, for example, and there are some um, regions or districts um, that have better access to um, senior management in, in the ministry, um, it may be that these will, that the um, budgets may be released for those first and for those regions or districts first, for example, um, and so on. So there are um, equity, equity problems can um, accumulate as the budget, if the budget isn't um, properly being executed. I think that's a very important consideration to, to take as something to be um, aware of at least. 
Then with regards to quality, right, so there, um, one can easily argue that if the budgets are insufficiently funded, that can uh, compromise service quality. Or if there's um, irregular cash release, that can compromise service quality. Right? Or if, I mean, sim simply think about inputs. Right? So if, if um, um, staff are available, but they don't have the adequate supplies or resources to operate with, then um, they're unlikely to, to um, you know, on the one hand, be motivated or um, produce high quality work. And lastly, um, accountability. So one can think about, um, I mean, so on the one hand, there's financial financial accountability, right? So and that under, undermines the foundation for um, a provider autonomy. Um, but then um, there, there can also accrue something that that we call an accountability gap. And so, if the if if um, for example, the lowest um, budget unit or spending unit in government is the district level, and and so the districts receive the funds, but the health the health facilities are um, charged with delivering the services. Then there's this accountability camp because the health facilities actually do the work, whereas the districts do the financial management. And and um, then either side can uh, can always argue that that um, service quality is poor because the other side hasn't do, done their job. Right. So health facilities will always be able to argue that. Um, they didn't receive the necessary support from the district level um, to do the work, and districts will argue that you know they did that funds were passed on um, in kind to health facilities, but the health facilities are just not doing it. And so, so um, and then it's difficult to hold either party um, accountable. So, thinking from inputs to outputs, and so and and I think it's good to just. Um, uh, remember the, the, the various inputs that, that um, drive a health sector um, production function. And so on the one hand, we have the civil servants, we have the, um, we have the health workers that need to get paid. Right? Um, if health workers don't get paid, it's likely, um, or if they don't get paid in full or they don't um, get paid on time, this is going to um, immediately uh, you know, affect um, service delivery quality. Right? So adequate compensation is absolutely critical and um, public financial management systems are important um, to, to facilitate that and make sure that there are, um, that, that um, this is done timely. And, and generally, as we look across countries, we do indeed find that wages are being paid simply because it's, it's a quasi-statutory payment. Right? So it's a very, very high priority for government that civil servants are indeed getting paid. But then another aspect of this is, of course, that um, that there are no ghost workers, that um, salary payments don't go out to, to people that don't exist. But, but I don't want to go too deep into this. Secondly, there is this um, there's drugs and medical supplies issue. And so um, frequently, um, these are being um, purchased in bulk um, from centrally, either by the Ministry of Health or central medical stores. And there are important procurement considerations and efficiency considerations in this aspect. So. Um, from a public financial management perspective, um, adequate procurement is absolutely um, critical, especially for these um, high value um, contracts. These can be framework contracts. And we see that if there are problems here, or if there are, for example, if there is a buildup of arrears as happened in countries such as Zambia, um, then that leads to, um, to a lot of problems. And, and there, there will eventually be disruption in, in um, the delivery of these essential drugs and medical supplies. And then how drugs um, are, are being delivered from the central medical stores to the various facilities is a supply chain management side, which I don't want to go into today. Um, then there is the operational budget for facilities. Right? Um, and it's necessary that facilities, as, as I discussed earlier, actually have resources to some, um, even if it is a limited operational budget, to do minor things such as you know, fixing, you know, a water tank, doing um, taking care of minor um, maintenance issues, um, purchasing emergency drugs, and and so on. And so, the FDD up for, um, a budget for for covering operational costs it will be absolutely critical, and is something um, and, and maybe a small share in terms of total um, government health expenditures, but it will be um, absolutely critical for facilitating. Um, um, 
adequate um, and ad adequate service delivery, public service delivery. And then there is, of course, um, the, the infrastructure aspects. And so, so there need to be um, the adequate infrastructures in place to, to actually deliver services. And so one can think of those four inputs within the public budget um, that, that um, need to be provided and that public financial management systems need to facilitate somehow so, such that together they can deliver um, outputs efficiently right? as, as the very first step in the, the um, health production function. So I would like to um, then turn into uh, turn to um, a very specific problem that is very that is frequently encountered in when one thinks about this space between public financial management and health and the relationship between ministries of health and the priorities that that the um, health sector has vis-a-vis -vis the priorities that that um, um, treasuries and ministries of finance um, frequently have right? and that's thinking through how to balance control aspects and flexibility aspects and so um, one can think about um, this this conundrum or this 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 challenge in terms of a quadrant right? where on the bottom left side on the, um, you, you can think about there as being um, limited um, control and flexibility <clears throat> right? and um, right, so you have this horizontal axis from um, low flexibility to higher flexibility and you have the vertical axis for where you have low, low accountability and control to high accountability and control I should say financial accountability and and um, as you as you go through this quadrant you see that um, you know as you shift um, to the upper part of the <clears throat> of the axis, and there the um, countries have um, higher control and, and accountability, and further to the right, that there is um, greater flexibility. So that the 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 balance to strike right, is one where there is sufficient um, accountability and, and control without giving up the necessary flexibility for service delivery. Um, now, why? Um, right. So, so why is this a problem? Right. So as I said earlier, from from a health provider perspective, right, they would like to have the um, flexibility necessary to um, to do what is needed. But um, from a control perspective, ministries of finance um, tend to make the argument that that the, um, you know you need to be delivering against what was promised in the budget originally within the beginning of the of the fiscal year. Right? So so um, this is this is um, one of the aspects to um, to get to and 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 um, one but and and issues that relate to this. Is this this question of the accountability gap that um, we talked about earlier, right? um, from the, the service delivery um, perspective? And so, so our health facilities, those that receive funds, um, um, how do you track spending against those things? What type of um, flexibility do they have on the use of those resources? And um, what are the kinds of incentives that are being set? And um, what are the and that there are uh, management challenges. So if and frequently, if you talk to health service providers, as um, we did in, in in Kenya, for example, those those were account um, concerns that were were frequently being raised. And and, and um, similarly in in Malawi, that was the case. And and they were basically making the case that <clears throat> they were. Um, at the you know at the at the left hand side of this that that, that, that they were not receiving the funds right? and that there was um, excessive control in the system right and that the funds that they were receiving and the type of support that they were receiving was mostly um, in kind support. Then um, from um, the treasury perspective, right, um, what are their main concerns? Right? So <clears throat> there's this fiduciary risk. Right? How, do you, how do we know that, that facilities are actually able to spend the funds? How do we de determine whether these um, funds were actually being used prudently? Are the right um, accounting systems um, in place? You know, are they merely posting to the ledger or is there some 
exempt the commitment control to avoid the accumulation of arrears and, and so on. And so there's this on the fiduciary side. Um, then um, there's this uh, performance question, right? So, so you know, they would, they would make the argument, well, how do we determine how much each facility would get? And if, if um, this is done against um, some output measure, how do we know that facilities aren't just um, simply gaming the system? And then there is this um, question around consolidate, uh, consolidation to fiscus. And so um, how do they, right? so facilities will argue that they should have a bank account. Um, this may be difficult to have a bank account um, within the treasury single account and that then, um, so, and then if facilities argue that they should have um, accounts in commercial um, banks that that will introduce all sorts of, of um, inefficiencies. And so how can you, how can you balance these, these types of um, concern um, for them right? and and um, one thing that I would like to point to here is that if you look at um, spending in the health sector um, it tends to be um, quite you know if you, if you look at spending uh, or the transaction profile and it tends to be quite skewed right? and there are some transactions that make up the majority of um, the volume of spending. And so and this is what I'm presenting here, I think is for the 2018, um, um, 2018 spending in Tanzania, where you see the, you know, th th there were about 70,000 um, transactions in, in the whole year. And that's um, less than 10% of the transactions. So the, the tail right-hand side um, made up, um, you know, just about 10% of the total volume of spending. And so there are some, a small number of transactions that make up the majority of spending. And here for these transactions, we argue that it is important to have all of those controls in place that we talked about. And you have the um, commitment controls that um, to avoid the accumulation of arrears to make sure that, uh, so this is where there is a real fiduciary risk. And those high value transactions are going to come from a specific set of inputs that we discussed earlier. Right, so those um, bulk procurement, um, those uh, contracts, for example, right, from, from drugs and medical supplies, from managing the wage bill appropriately. <clears throat> That's um, maybe from, from um, large infrastructure contracts. So those things exist. And, and that's where the, um, so it's important to, to keep in mind where those um, fiduciary risks actually potentially come from and, and to take a risk-based approach in terms of your control strategy. Um, then there are those other 60,000 transactions at which, which um, make up only 10% of the volume of the budget. And these are very small value transactions. And um, for those, arguably, there is a um, lesser fiduciary risk but for those, that's so you see the, like from transaction number one up to transaction number 60, right? they, these transactions are quite small in, in, in terms of, of even cumulatively, cumulatively um, what they constitute in terms of the, um, total government health expenditures. Um, and these transactions, if you look at where they come from, these are, this is the operational expenditures of health, of frontline health facilities. And this is the, you know, maintenance expenditures. These are um, for small, for, for purchasing um, emergency drugs here and there, for um, paying a supplier to fix the water tank, as I mentioned earlier. And this is uh, small expenditures here and there that are absolutely critical for making service delivery happen, but pose less of a fiduciary risk than some of those high value transactions that I mentioned. So um, arguably, one can make the case for a differentiated control strategy right, where, where you extend some of the necessary flexibility to frontline health service providers, um, while at the same time not giving up on, on essential controls for the high value transactions. But, and and if, you, if you look at this and you go back, then um, this would be an approach of how to balance accountability and control, right? because you, you, you allow for the necessary um, flexibility for the low value transactions while making sure that um, that there is sufficient control for um, the high value transactions. So um, what to take away from our um, presentation is that uh, first of all, good public financial management will reduce the cost of achieving um, UHC 
and um, that, that there are some sort of there's some studies out there that actually look at um, that actually um, quantify this. Right? So um, that look at PFAS scores and 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 um, correlates um, PFAS scores to to say things like um, child mortality or maternal mortality rates. And, and there is indeed evidence that good public financial management means that that um, you that that there are very important efficiency gains. So, secondly, public financial management is really a practical question. That governments deal with developing a budget um, on the, and and implementing a budget on a on a day to day basis. They deal with procurement challenges. They deal with with having to um, account for things, monitor things, report again against things and this is a natural cycle in every country and while there may be some differences here and there and how things are being done um, essentially um, you know this is something that, that that you don't get around in the health sector and um, and therefore <clears throat> thinking about how public financial management affects health and health service delivery outcomes is absolutely critical in terms of um, thinking through um, health systems performance then good public financial management will en enable facility payments and set the right incentives. And so where, so, you know, it's important to think through where health facilities are actually in this entire process. If you think through this earlier chart of this, this framework and where we looked at the transmission channels, and it's important to kind of consider like are health facilities actually spending units in the budget or not? Can they receive, um, can they receive some sort of grants um, one way or another, and and if not, then then it's very difficult to, to talk about purchasing type questions in the first place. That if, if health facilities only receive um, in kind support from higher levels administration, as they do in a number of countries, uh, then then you're not really purchasing anything. <clears throat> and and you know, as we know in the you know in, in you know the health economics discipline that you know strategic purchasing is is absolutely central and and a pillar and, and and affects very much the incentives that are being set for for efficiency and and quality of service provision then good public financial management will strengthen accountability and here um it's also important to think through um, um accountability not only from an accounting perspective or from a financial accountability perspective and but this, this um, accountability gap that we mentioned earlier, and this, this question of who receives funds and who actually delivers the services. And, and good public financial management will ensure that there is a very close and tight link um, between those aspects. And lastly, the point that I wanted to mention is um, that adequate public financial management will ensure that there is sufficient flexibility um, in the system to adjust to changing needs. And and, and um, that that service providers can actually operate um, well and and have the autonomy to make important decisions um, as things come up right? and that this is being is possible without giving up on accountability um, type of concerns. With that, um, let me um, pass the floor to my colleague, colleague Collins Chancer to talk about the, the Kenya, Zambia and Malawi experience where we have done um, public financial management assessments. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Collins, over to you. Uh, yeah, before, uh, before Collins come in, I think he, I just want to note that uh, we are running behind schedule. So could I request uh, uh, Collins to keep it very short, please, if you're able to do it in just like two or three minutes, if that's, if that's possible, so that, uh, so that uh, we don't go beyond our allocated time. Yes, I think I'll just do two minutes, Max. Uh, we have a lot to share, but I think I'll just share two slides. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Maybe I must. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So I think I'll just pick it up from where Maurice was saying, uh, talking about PFM being very practical. Um, I know we all like using a lot of uh, mathematical models. We have the DA, the PFM, the 
SFA, and of course, um, the Optima. These are very useful, but then if you talk to uh, any policymaker, um, the policymaker would say, yes, uh, the system is inefficient, but then how do you help me to, to improve um, uh, the system? So there then becomes a problem. If um, you're not well visited in the use of the, the PFOM uh, assessment models, which Moritz talked about. So um, for instance, um, um, if it comes to uh, efficiency, um, we know that um, for you to make changes, um, if you want to move human resource or if you want to change the procurement system for drugs, those things take time. So you need to understand really where the problems are. So, um, and, and as Moit had, had, had mentioned, PFM will talk to the value for money, uh, credit issues, uh, and uh, if you look at uh, countries, uh, my own country, Zambia, we did have a framework contract for the procurement of, of um, drugs and medical supply. And um, I think there were some issues uh, with that. And then the ministry then changed um, uh, suppliers to a supplier who could not uh, guarantee, um, you know, continuous supply and in the end, um, the quality of drugs which were procured were of less quality. So again, again, that points to PFM issues. And then we've seen like drug thefts. Um, of course, this cuts across Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, Kenya. Again, without proper control uh, mechanisms in place, and then there's a problem. So I'll just give you one example of how this was applied, the framework which uh, Moritz had talked about. We did apply it in in Malawi, in one of the studies, um, we're just finalizing this. We have discussed with government who will be uh, publishing these results in the next one month or so. But we made, uh, we, we undertook the, the assessment at facility level and we made a comparison between health centers and dispensaries uh, owned by government and, and, and faith based organizations called CHAM. And um, also, we look, also looked at hospitals. And again, we compared between government and, and CHAM facilities. And we looked at all those parameters, which um, uh, Maurice was talking about uh, formulation, execution, and evaluation, the various uh, uh, points of the budget, and the measures which we use to, to gauge where efficiency, equity, uh, quality, and accountability. So as you can see, um, I won't uh, go in detail. Um, if you look at the, the health centers and dispensaries, you notice that government um, institutions performed consistently poorer than the charm facilities. And the same um, also for the hospitals where charm uh, performed far much better than the government. Uh, um, uh, health, health centers. Now, the good thing is that within the same assessment, um, there are those uh, issues which were specifically ad identified to be able to make those corrective uh, measures. For instance, in some cases that had to do with budget formulation, uh, policy and planning, and also uh, issues to do with uh, uh, stock management and the rest. So, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that by applying this. Uh, frameworks um, at lower levels, you'll be able to quickly identify where the problem is, and it'll be easier to make those corrective measures. Uh, and our recommendation is that, uh, I know people would not stop using the mathematical models, but when, if you use the mathematical model, you will then have to complement it with a PMFM assessment so that you know where the issues are, and then you make those corrective measures. Let me end there and then, uh, Pass on to the next presenter. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Collins, for keeping it uh, really short. Uh, I think I will not uh, waste much time, uh, but invite the next presenters, Tom Hart and uh, Takondo Masse, to give us the second presentation. And uh, this will be made by Tom. So may I invite you, Tom, to, to give us the presentation 
and request you to, to keep it short. If you can do this in say 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes so that we have a bit of time for discussion. Tom, please. Thank you, Edward. I will do my, I will do my best. Um, just to check that you're seeing the right slides. Um, can everybody see the slides okay? Seeing it in presenter view, Tom. Okay, let me just switch that around. I think maybe in display settings. Yes, yeah, so I've lost that. Where is it? It's not, I think. Um... Just next to show toolbar, I think, taskbar. Yeah, that's disappearing for me for some reason. Uh... Oh, here we go. All right. Okay. Hopefully, you should now, that should have sorted out. Great. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. I will go through as quickly as I can. Um, and just to emphasize again, um, I'm presenting on behalf of both myself and, and to Condwa. Um, and I'm gonna take a, a slightly different angle from um, the angle Moritz and um, Collins has just taken and try to talk a bit about how um, some of the kind of concepts that are used more on the health financing side of strategic for purchasing fit together with, with um, uh, PFM. So I'm going to discuss some of the points of interconnection and two specific areas of um, implementing health benefits packages and on kind of provider payment reform. So how, how, how reforms, um, uh, how, how funds reach, reach facilities. Um, I'm just going to skip past this slide on the kind of definitions of um, PFM and strategic purchasing as Maritz has kind of um, covered these in, in um, already. But I, I guess the kind of points I just want to emphasize are, you know, that the, these both describe um, policy processes with kind of intended outcomes. Um, and the kind of common interest shared between, between both of them is enhancing the um, efficiency of spending. Um, but I think, you know, in, in talking about this, it's important to note that these kind of concepts um, are associated with different kind of um, epistemic communities, you know, a PFM community on the one hand and a kind of health financing, health economics community on the other hand, and also with, with different um, organisations as well. So, you know, most PFM practitioners are used to working primarily with finance ministries and, and obviously health financing, health economics, uh, um, researchers and practitioners with, with ministries of health. And often there's similar concepts which use different language, um, uh, which can lead to people kind of talking past each other. Um, but I think it's also important to kind of highlight there's, I think there's important things to learn across the different communities. So I think especially, you know, ministries of finance and the PFM community don't always understand the kind of specific needs of the, the health sector and how PFM systems can support improved service delivery as opposed to other objectives like um, maintaining fiscal discipline. Um, and I think there are, there are some important lessons on, on PFM reform um, that, that are important for the kind of health financing um, uh, and health, health economics community to learn as well. Um, and, you know, I think the, these two communities are slightly different questions and Moritz has already kind of been through some of these, but, you know, some of the key questions in PFM are, you know, is the budget policy base, is it executed reliably, um, do resources flow reliably to service providers? Um, and on strategic purchasing, the primary questions are, you know, what services should be covered, which providers should deliver them and how they, should they be paid for? So just moving on to the kind of two key points of interconnection are on benefit packages and, and um, budget formulation. So 
both of these should be exercises in prioritization. Both of them are attempts to, you know, allocate resources um, as efficiently as possible within a limited resource envelope. And so the key, I think the key kind of implementation query there is how do we ensure that prioritization decisions that are taken in health benefit package formulation translate into budgets? Um, and the, the second kind of key area is on provider payment mechanisms and, um, you know, and how resources reach the front line. And I think, you know, Moritz has already mentioned some of this. Um, and I think, you know, especially in kind of, I think there's quite a widespread uh, perception that, that PFM systems often constrain provider payment reforms. Uh, um, and there's, there's a couple of quotes there that, you know, it's, it's, poor flexibility, lack of autonomy, um, and concerns as well that kind of um, where you've got controls that are based on kind of inputs, you know, controlling for salaries, operating costs, and so on, um, then kind of moving to output-based systems isn't, isn't possible. Um, so on essential health packages, so this is the kind of example from Malawi's essential health package, um, and we, a summary of it, it's 97 prioritised interventions um, across across those um, categories, um, and that has to be implemented through a health budget that is um, formulated based on um, organisations and um, line items. So across the Ministry of Health, um, which budgets for um, the the um, the main tertiary hospitals, um, across um, the National Local Government Finance Commission that holds the the budget for the um, drugs for the, the um, districts access and then across districts who are um, you know in charge of um, district hospitals and, and um, health centers and the primary facilities um, so how should how do you match these two things how do you make sure that your budget is delivering those interventions so one answer is that it's about provider payment reform um, so um, many of you will know the, the, um, the, the book on, um, re a recent book on um, health benefits packages that many of the Tansy team um, have, have contributed to. Um, and, you know, that highlights that talking about the kind of financial aspects of this is there's not much literature on it, um, not much research on it. And the suggestion is that um, you need to kind of move your budget so that it looks more like your benefits package effectively. So budgets are coded and tracked in a way. And this implies, you know, some kind of paper performance or fee for service or case based payment system. Um, and so, you know, if that's if that's one way of doing this, it's important to look at, you know, is, is that feasible, um, you know, and is it going to be feasible in different types of contexts as well? Um, and so thinking about the kind of administrative capacity needed to do this. And, you know, as, as um, Moritz was saying, you know, the PFM system is very practical. It's thinking about, you know, how these systems operate um, on the ground. So, you know, the, the, the first thing we know in terms of um, in at least in sub-Saharan Africa, the kind of arguably one of the biggest kind of most common um, performance-based systems is performance-based financing systems. And we know that um, many of them have typically remained as pilots and have not been integrated into national PFM systems. Um, within the PFM literature, there's kind of long-standing arguments that, that um, you know, if you don't, if you're not in an environment where formal contracts are reliably enforced in the private sector, then you should probably not be trying to make sure that kind of more formal contracting type mechanisms are applied in the, in the public sector. Um, we've also got lessons that um, in across the patterns of PFM reforms that um, it's much more difficult to um, re undertake reforms that are kind of going to be implemented by a distributed network of many actors rather than the types of reforms that are kind of centralised in in um, in the finance ministry. Um, and there's questions of the capacity to deal with the unintended consequences of high powered financial incentives like gaming, like uh, multitasking, where you only focus on the incentivized activities and, and equity as well, whether it um, produces skewed um, allocation of resources to the already well-served areas. 
Um, and in Malawi, we have some examples of implementation problems with the kind of fee-for-service type schemes that have been um, implemented with faith praise providers um, with, with some of the problems about concerns about inflated invoices, um, late payments um, and a build-up of debt and a, a question of if you're paying on a fee-for-service, how you then control the total budget for that um, and how you make sure that facilities provide the level of services that there are actually resources for. Um, and I think a key a key question is is on this is talking about the distinction between where we think um, services require autonomy and where services require kind of financial incentives in the form of out, output based payments and, and going back to the definition of strategic purchasing that talks about the allocation of resources based on population health needs and on the provider, uh, the performance of providers. And I think, you know, one thing is that most of the discussion, there's been a relative neglect of thinking about how you allocate based on need versus allocating on performance. And, um, you know, I think in, in Malawi, there's been a strong focus, which I think is, is exactly right on um, thinking about how you can um, reconfigure those allocations so that they're more, they're more equitable. Um, and I, you know, in, in terms of thinking about is, is it facility autonomy that's important or is it incentives that are important? I think there is kind of, you know, that standard economic theory tends to suggest that um, there's a weak case um, for high powered incentives in the public sector because of monitoring multitasking um, issues. Um, and there's also, I think, an, an emerging body of evidence that does suggest that what really matters for improving performance is autonomy rather than incentives. So um, there's two recent um, randomized control trials of performance-based financing, which Collins is the author on one of them in, in Zambia and one in Nigeria, both, both um, which both found that compared giving facilities funding that was not um, conditioned on performance and, um, and compared it with PBF and found that the, the um, direct facility financing was more cost effective. And the, the kind of theory behind that is that because it's what, what matters is the kind of improved management and aligning, as Moritz talked about, aligning the kind of financial accountability with, uh, with the management accountability rather than the performance incentives themselves. And there's also kind of a recent broader literature, um, you know, in looking at kind of uh, public sector that's looked at West Africa that has found that, you know, across the public sector, it's, it's autonomy that really mattered for, for um, performance of the public sector in Ghana and Nigeria, rather than kind of, rather than performance incentives themselves. Um, so how should we think about if, if it's this kind of making sure there's not this accountability gap that Moritz talked about and aligning um, responsibility for budgetary management and service provision that really matters, how, how should we think about this? And just to give an example of, of Uganda, the picture you have in front of you are, is the, is the um, budget allocations. And Uganda is fairly unusual that, you know, as well as the budget for the Ministry of Health, each of its main referral hospitals, so about 20 of its regional referral hospitals, are their own vote. So the, the head of the hospital is their own accounting officer and they're responsible for kind of formulating and executing their own budgets. Then um, in Uganda at local government level, the amounts for each um, primary facility is clearly shown in the local government budget and the transfers are made directly from the national treasury to, to each primary facility who manages its own bank account. Um, so then coming to kind of conclusions from this and areas to explore, I think, you know, just highlighting that the kind of key allocation challenge is making sure that you know, each, um, each organizational unit, whether that's a district or a facility, um, has the resources to deliver the kind of, um, the, the set of health services that are, are, are in policy. Um, and if that's an essential health package, of course, that the key kind of challenge for essential health packages are making sure that they are a resource constrained exercise that are based on a realistic assessment of the uh, level of resources available. Um, I think the second thing is that, you know, if, if, if it's facility autonomy that matters rather than performance incentives, getting what we might call in kind of PFM jargon, the plumbing 
the, the fund flows to facilities right should be relatively simple and i think the health sector can always look to the education sector where school capitation grants uh, are more long-standing and, and quite widespread as well um, and I think it, that suggests the focus is first on kind of monitoring whether these inputs are used to provide the intended set of services and managing providers where, where um, the, the kind of data suggests this is not the case. Um, and so this is the same kind of set of um, uh, topics which I think need to be further explored, which is, you know, the, the, the tensions and balance between allocation based on need and allocation based on provider performance administrative capacities to manage unintended consequences of, of high powered financial incentives um, connected to that questions of whether whether performance can be improved through kind of softer management and oversight um, versus improved through kind of direct financial incentives um, you know the, the questions of internal management and control within providers and I think you know the data Collins just presented speaks to the importance of, of that and understanding that. And I think, um, you know, the spending risks of changes in health seeking behavior where you've got an incomplete purchase of provider split. So, you know, as in Malawi, the, the non, um, the, the faith based organizations being contracted as alongside um, government facilities. And if there's a change in provider behavior to, um, you know, uh, so to, to private facilities which are being paid on something like a fee-for-service mechanism away from government facilities then government is still paying the salaries and budgets for the for the government-owned clinics um, even if uh, uh, health, health um, behavior starts using the, the fee-for-service based facilities more and that obviously poses a budgetary risk and a kind of efficiency of um, the overall public spend in the health sector. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom and Takondwa, for that presentation, and for keeping it short. I think uh, we have uh, we'll have a bit of time for for discussion or Q and A. So, participants, there we are with uh, two presentations for the webinar today. We will now move on to the Q and A session, and uh, let me uh, invite uh, Paul to moderate the Q and A session. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Edward, and thanks to the speakers for a really excellent talks um, again. So we, we, we have really a good participation on, on today's uh, webinar. I wonder if I could ask Alex to bring everyone into the main um, room to facilitate the, the discussion. Uh, I can see we have uh, participants on from at least 14 countries. Um, actually Uganda, Gambia, Malawi, Zambia, Swatini, Kenya, UK, US, Zimbabwe, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, Lesotho, Ghana. So it should um, really be a wealth of experience to draw upon um, in both uh, recounting your own experiences and also asking uh, questions of, of the speakers. Um, so we can ask questions either through uh, raising the hand, uh, hopefully you can see the raise hand button uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, or if you uh, prefer, uh, you may also use the uh, the the, the Q and A. Um, but I can see there's in a question already in the Q and A from an anonymous attendee. I wonder uh, if the person would like to raise the hand and ask the question uh, themselves. Otherwise, I can I can read this off. So please uh, open the floor to, to questions. <coughs> please raise your hands or, or use the Q and A. If I can maybe begin with, uh, I can read the question in the Q&A. Uh, this is for all of the speakers. Um, the question is, what's the best way to conduct a, a PFM assessment? Uh, are there any examples you can recommend? And I guess here, uh, this is asking for examples of, of best practice, uh, which can be found uh, from the literature. I know uh, some were presented, but I just ask this again for uh, the speakers. Tom, do you have? Um, Sorry, Maurice, right. you go ahead first and then I'll come in. I'll come in next. Sure. Um, I think that really um, depends on what kind of question you would like to ask. That's, um, so there is, there are a set of, of um, 
diagnostic tools out there um, and and ODI has actually um, developed or put together an excellent paper that that looks at this um, the various tools that are out there. There's one from the World Bank, there's one from UNICEF and so on. Um, and um, right, and what Collins and I have just presented looks at these at, at the purchasing um, aspects of it. So I think um, the, the ODI paper is an excellent excellent starting point um, to see what's out there, the universe of what's out there, and then um, and and then I think the, the the important question really is what is what is it that what type of question do you actually would like want to answer because PB, PFM is such a broad um, topic. Th thank you, Boots. Maybe the um, uh, if the person who's asked the question has any more specific, like to be more specific in terms of what aspects of PFM they're looking for, maybe we can um, expand further. But could I ask Tom uh, if you have any uh, any immediate thoughts? Um, yes, I'm just going to um, put in the in the box. I will share the details of the the paper that. Um, Myself and colleagues um, looked at some of the different tools available, but I, I think my first, my first, what I would have said is exactly what Moritz said, which is, you know, it, it depends on the, um, you know, it depends on the nature of the question, um, and I think, you know, one one of the things that um, uh, that that we need to understand is, you know, it, saying that it's understanding bottlenecks to spending in health. Um, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the diagnostics that are uh, that are out there have kind of, you know, the PFM. There's general PFM ones that focus kind of broadly on the PFM system, but they're they're not going to tell you about how it operates differently in the health sector, or if it operates the same or differently in the health sector as as it does kind of if you're looking at the the, the Ministry of Finance. Um, and there's quite a few health financing diagnostics that look at, um, you know, but look at things kind of from a broad top down, like the mix of um, financing sources and so on. Um, so I think um, the the common ones which are, which might um, be useful is to um, look at public expenditure tracking surveys and so on. Um, and that is covered in the paper. So I'd recommend, you know, maybe having a look at that and having a, a look. And I'll also share, um, we, we've did an older paper, which has a kind of section that looks at what the experience of public expenditure tracking surveys um, in the health sector um, can tell us. Although though one thing we do notice is that, you know, the, the, the use of those has kind of appeared to have changed over time. And certainly in the last decade, um, there's been far fewer of those done than there has the, there was in the in the first decade um, of, of the 2000s. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. It's, um, I can see um, Elizabeth has her hand raised. I wonder if anyone who asks questions, if you can possibly introduce yourself, um, your institution, uh, and then ask your questions to the speakers. So over to Elizabeth. Okay, um, thank you. This is Elizabeth Kirapa from Makere University in Uganda. So um, thank you all the speakers for very informative presentations. My question goes to Collins. In the second slide that you presented, um, there were quite um, clear differences between um, what was happening at the health centers and what was happening at the hospitals and then also between um, the government and the NGO. The performance seemed um, much poorer at health center level when you'd look at you know, the budget execution, formulation. Performance seemed poorer at the health centers compared to the hospitals. And um, there were also differences, marked differences in performance between government and um, the NGOs mainly at hospital level compared to health center level. So I just wanted to understand what some of the key issues or reasons um, were for those particular differences. Then um, the, the, the second question, um, I forget who was um, presenting about the public financial management um, systems and the challenge of implementing strategic purchasing when you're using a system where um, you're, you're, you're provided you know, with inputs, wages, salaries, and so on, and, and everything is determined. And 
the challenge of applying that, especially also in a context where corruption is, is quite high, such that you, 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 you're also a bit concerned about you know, being liberal or giving too much control. What, what options are there then for using strategic purchasing within that kind of public financial management um, system and context? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, can I ask the speakers to, to respond? Collins. Okay, all like right. So, so we, we are going to share the, the, um, the main uh, paper. At the moment, what we are doing is we, we are actually just editing it and we have actually extracted a policy brief, which will be actually very helpful. Uh, but what you observed, Elizabeth, is very correct. Um, and this has to deal with uh, the different levels of uh, capacities. Um, so if you look at the, um, first of all, let me just talk over the levels, um, at formula budget, budget formulation, execution, and evaluation. What we found that was that um, at health center levels, the capacities were lower uh, as compared to hospitals. So those they could actually uh, formulate uh, the budget better as compared to the counterparts at uh, health centers. In, in, as a matter of fact, as you know, the health system in Malawi is decentralized. So they do get their money through the district council. So sometimes there are those interfiscal transfers where they're not aware of the money which have come and, um, and um, uh, how much that money has been spent and, and, and in terms of the reporting the system um, was uh, a bit rigid. So if you compare those elements between say government and then the faith-based organization, the CHAM, you find that those since they're not, um, they have their own um, uh, operating environment, they're able to uh, perform better uh, as compared to the government institutions. Um, also one issue which um, Maurice talked about and also one of the participants addressed in terms of the control environment, of course, it's nice to have these controls, but when you come to the government facilities, uh, the controls uh, in terms of uh, uh, flexibility of changing, they are quite rigid. You compare between the government and jam facilities such that then the government officials would uh, override the system and then implement uh, uh, whatever they wanted and that had a bearing on transparency and accountability. And it points to the the issue which Moritz raised that, um, yes, it's important to have the controls, but then they have to be a bit flexible to be able to accommodate some of like uh, a change, which of course has to be transparent. So we saw those changes and I think um, the recommendation which we make in the paper is that probably there could be more autonomy at the health center levels. Uh, and also that um, the government may try to, um, you know, uh, copy some of the good practices from the jam facility so in order to improve public finance management. So there are a number of issues interesting which actually could be raised uh, um, to the, with government and then also the government can make those changes pretty quickly and then the results could be seen without um, necessarily look, asking for additional resources. Over. Uh, thank you, Collins. Um, ask Tom and Takondra if you have any quick, quick thoughts in response. If, if not, I see a hand raised from Paul Tung. I would like to ask your question, Paul. Uh, please introduce yourself also. Yeah. Yep, um, Paul Tung, um, economic advisor with um, UKFCDO. Uh, if you all remember, that is... Uh, Formerly DFID, so I I want I want to ask around accountability mechanisms um, on this. In Kenya, for example, health is a devolved function, and therefore uh, delivery of services is with the, the county governments, basically uh, like states. Uh, while uh, the policy framework around health is with the national ministry, how could we bridge the accountability gap? Even though uh, the PFM acts. Uh, cascades uh, downstairs. But some of the suggestions, for example, may border on changing the 
a policy framework around healthcare, uh, health services provision, that is one. Two, is what would be the role of um, the, the, the civil society organizations, uh, development partners in, uh, in pushing for accountability uh, within the health sector? And lastly, how should we address gaming of the system, especially in, uh, in procurement? It's quite a difficult uh, nut to crack, especially over here in Kenya. Thank you and back to you. Thank you, Paul. So, um, three really interesting and challenging questions there. Could I ask uh, the speakers to respond, uh, particularly in terms of how PFM um, uh, can best function in the in, in case of devolved systems, such as has happened uh, in, in Kenya, uh, but also in response to Paul's uh, other two questions around the role of the civil society development partners uh, and any recommendations for reducing gaming uh, uh, in, in, in procurement and purchasing. Um, I can talk briefly on the on the devolved setting. So I think the the, the question really is here one of um, what is the role again Kenya specifically of the um, of the various counties vis-a-vis -vis the, the health service providers. Right. So you um, so there are transfers from from um, central government to um, the county revenue fund, and then the the, the purchasing decisions that should um, take place is between the um, the contractual arrangements between the county and the various hospitals and and, and health facilities. Right? So um, because the, but but what what tends to happen is that that um, and there is of course um, quite a lot of heterogeneity um, amongst across counties, but that um, health facilities actually don't receive funds in Kenya, right? So there's this recent paper that was called Recentralization through Decentralization, I think, or something along those lines. And it was quite interesting, right? Um, because it's, um, because this, um, because at the point that they're making is that um, prior to um, this decentralization process, um, health service providers actually had, had more autonomy. But, uh, um, so the point here really is um, how do counties actually purchase services from those health facilities and and uh, the, the emerging evidence seems to suggest that that um, um, county governments procuring um, everything on behalf of um, health facilities is is a system that's not very working very well and so in order to in order to engage in in uh, purchasing dialogue I think um, this door needs to be opened that actual these conditional and unconditional grants actually make it all the way down to, to the actual service providers. And that way you can then bridge this accountability gap. Maybe Thank just you. to add on, um, also um, when you talk of accountability, it's a two-way process. I know in most of the countries, including Kenya, there is uh, maybe reports from the Auditor General or the anti-corruption commission, whatever commission is there, but it's the appetite for the responsible institution to act. Maybe the report may be not be so specific um, to point out what the issues are. So undertaking assessments like we have shown where you do a, a detailed PFM uh, assessment will pr provide that uh, um, information or food for the civil society organizations and partners to use when they want to uh, claim for accountability um, improvements from the council. So I think the starting point is to always make sure that you make the assessment and if there's the issues of gaming the system, you identify them quickly and then you make these corrective uh, measures. I think this, this has to be uh, done at a regular basis. Thank you, Collins. I think we've got time for one more question. I can see one uh, at hand up. Director Jibril Jadju, would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Jibril, and then um, ask your question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, I am Jibril Jadju, the Director of Planning and Information, Minister of Health, Health Economics and Health Finances as well. Yeah, um, it's just a short one. And first, uh, thanks for the presentation. It's a good insight to what is happening around the world, as well as my sister countries in, in Africa. Uh, uh, you know, the, the discussion is around PFM, how we reform our health. But in, in the Gambia, for example, 
we, you know, we are trying to implement a, um, uh, a program-based budgeting. So my question will be, how do we, you know, reform around aligning the PFM reforms with the program-based budgeting? And how do we, you know, make sure that uh, the two work in tandem, the reforms in the PFM to be in line with the reform in the program-based uh, budgeting? You all know that, uh, you know, some countries are still implementing the traditional way of line budgeting, which is actually affecting, you know, output in the health sector in relation to strategic, uh, strategic purchasing. So how do we, you know, align these two reforms, you know, going forward? Yeah. Um, Gabriel, <clears throat> if I can um, take on um, this question briefly, and then maybe colleagues would like to contribute. I think this is a very important question and that there is a lot of potential in program budgeting. And there is, however, also um, some, so the, the experience internationally with program budgeting has been somewhat mixed because it is quite a complex reform to actually get right. But there, but if the program budget structure is um, done, set up carefully, you could, you could have a, um, a system where you have, for example, a primary care sub program, and then the sub program, and then there's a contractual relationship between the sub program um, and the health service providers, and then like how much like, there's a budget allocated to the sub program, and um, how the various health facilities receive a budget will then depend on the contractual relationship between the sub program and and those health facilities and so and then and that way you could then engage in in a purchasing dialogue the um the difficulty is just um i think how the program is designed and the complexity of of the design and the relationship between the administrative structures in the Ministry of Health and the program structures. Because um, complexities can come in that then um, undermine um, the entire effort because, because it becomes so difficult to actually implement and get right. So, um, but I don't think that, that um, the difficulty of doing it um, perhaps should, should um, prevent countries from from trying to get it right, but there, there are, and there is, I should also point out that the WHO has um, engaged in, in putting together a book on, on how the program budgets are being designed in the health sector and, and implemented. Um, and I think that would be a very valuable resource. I think that's probably due to come out in October, but um, excellent question and, and a lot of potential here. I think, um, especially also with this, um, performance-based financing reforms that, that are ongoing in many countries, the, the question should really be of how, you know, how can one transition away from a PBF type engagement that is um, project-based and quite um, vertical in nature to align with some of these program budgeting reforms that are ongoing. But thanks again for the excellent question. Maybe just to add, to add quickly on that one. Um, so, yeah, so what, also, what is be important also is that when, I know most of the countries, um, um, I know Uganda, Zambia, they are doing this cluster planning, and they are also doing output-based budget, you know, program-based budgeting. But I think to make it more effective, like Maurice is saying, then you have to follow it through up to the sector ministries so that they also do some sort of uh, specific performance-based financing, because if you find the budget um, based on output uh, program, and then the implementation is based on input, then it defeat, defeats the process. So there, there has to be a, a, a think process which links the two, so that um, the two talk to each other. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, it's a really important question to end upon, but we are out of time. I'd just like to ask Takondra if he has any quick thoughts on, or, 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 or on this question of alignment with uh, overarching policy reforms. Takombro? Thank you. I think Collins has uh, managed to answer the question. I would just like to add that in the Malawi context, when the issue arose, like the one whereby the EHP versus 
the EHP being along the interventions, then they find the way we budget, the, the, the ministry budgets is along the line items. Then there were huge problems. At around mid 2015 or so, 2016, there was a change of saying, okay, how best can this be achieved? To achieve that, there was a like a team that worked around to say we needed to make sure that we do a prospective type of a budgeting capitation to say for well, those who are like to say this is the budget that we are expecting from the facility, that facility that was going to provide the services with strong verification system. However, as that the implementation has gone ahead, it is still proving to be a problem because still it is passive. It goes back to fee for service. We charge for this service. This service was not there. So it has again gone to huge areas being incurred. So what should be the future? The future should be to make sure that whoever is thinking about the PFM reform to say we are going capitation or we are going capitation for primary services, for example. Let us make sure that we change. We are no longer talking about a, the input based. This has to be reflected in the reforms from top all the way down. If we are going to pay hospitals through maybe a change of it, we are going for case-based payments, let us make sure that we change also the act, the PFM Act. Say so this is the way now we are, this is the major reform we are carrying out, and this is the way we want to implement, to implement it. Rather than we are talking about services, we say, oh, an EHP, all this service, then when we are budgeting, all program budgeting, but we are still paying for inputs, I don't think it will lead us anywhere. All over the, in most of the countries are the examples you've given from the Gambia, from Zambia, even from Malawi here, we had an issue with the program budgeting. It's, it's all there. The whole issue is, what do we mean? This is the big question we should take. When we say, let us do PFM reforms at the, and how that those PFM reforms reflect in service delivery. How do we pay providers? Now, how does the act change, the PFM act to reflect that? If it doesn't change, then let us forget about uh, the cosmetic reforms we are proposing in the health sector. If the Ministry of Finance is not convinced that we need to change the act to reflect the provider payment mechanisms we have in our countries, then we are in for a rough ride. We are back to where we were, the same problems we've been encountering will continue until the Ministry of Finance gets it to say we are going to change the way maybe the health sector alone pays providers, and this should be reflected in the act. Thank you. Thank you, Takon. We're words of wisdom um, there for us all. It feels like we could continue this discussion for some time, but we are beyond uh, beyond time. I'd just uh, like to draw everyone's attention uh, to the Q&A box. Uh, most questions which haven't been uh, aired have responses in the Q&A, and you can also find their materials um, for a course uh, on PFM, which Sally Lake has shared, and also um, a, a book uh, which Tom Hart uh, has shared here. So please uh, look at those for, for further information and details. Really important topic, really interesting discussions. Uh, I'll hand over to Edward Katika to close the, the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. So this brings us to the end of the webinar for today. And uh, I would like to thank you all for joining and for the active uh, participation. As uh, Paul observed, uh, today we had participation from uh, several countries, from the EXA uh, region, but also from the WAHO, the West Africa Health Organization uh, region. So this is very good uh, for the community of practice because uh, through this interaction, we benefit from the rich experience of uh, you know, participants from across the, the two regions, in addition to the expert knowledge of our, our, of our presenters. 
let me also thank our four presenters for today, Moritz Piatti, Collins Chancer, Tom Hart, and uh, Takon Vamase for the insightful uh, presentations, which generated a lot of discussion. I see that, you know, people are still, you know, itching to, to, to speak, but unfortunately we'll have to close. I think we will continue with, we'll find a, a, a proper way, a proper forum where we can continue with these uh, uh, discussions. We have uh, more webinars lined up that will be coming up in the in the next uh, couple of weeks. I think we, we had sent out a flyer outlining which webinars, which topics we'll have for future webinars. We'll be sending reminders on the dates and topics for, for the upcoming webinars. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you again in the upcoming webinars. So thank you very much once again. I'll now bring the webinar to a close. Thank you.